back again, Tony D'Angelo here in Connecticut Morning. We are scheduled to be joined, I we have him right now, Paul Peterson, a actor, activist, legend. And uh, Paul, uh, good morning to you. It's actually afternoon to us. Um, Tony D'Angelo here in Connecticut Morning. How have you been, our friend? Everything is fine. You know, I love this time of year. The holiday season is always the best. How was your Thanksgiving? It was great. Thank you for asking. It was just kind of a quiet time. And, uh, you know, Thanksgiving is one of those holidays I think you kind of have to find your groove and stick with it. Some people like a lot of people around and a lot of craziness. I, I kind of tend to the quiet side, and uh, I, I think it's... Uh, you know, when we talked about earlier, you know, being comfortable in your own skin, and, and really the most important thing is, you know, giving thanks for all the good we have in this country, even still. Yeah, they're all exactly right, exactly right. I know uh, you know, we had plenty of family. I couldn't get to see all my kids. They were all busy, uh, but uh, it was a wonderful day. It's, uh, it certainly was. Now, uh, in, in catching up with you, just a little bit of background uh, to our friends and our fans about Paul. Paul is a longtime actor, author, um, activist, pr particularly active in the movie industry with respect to uh, the uh, welfare of child actors. Paul, can you tell everyone how you got started uh, in the protective uh, role uh, with respect to child actors and uh, what your uh, life has been as of late. You know, last time we talked about the history of where you had been and uh, things that had happened through through the years and some of the things. And I'd like to think, as I was driving here today, maybe things have improved in recent days, but uh, I, uh, I'm i going to get it from the horse's mouth. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just very curious. Well, it, it, interestingly enough, we are making progress, but uh, it is not nearly enough. Um, just to put the proper framework in this, you know, growing up as a child star, whether your career is sustained or not, is a unique experience. And the, the trouble uh, comes when you think you're the only one it's ever happened to. There have been kid stars since the silent era of Hollywood. And I was going to a lot of funerals back in the 80s and the early 90s. And uh, I finally had enough. I decided, since these were my classmates, as it were, that I was going to try to do something to help. And that's when we started a minor consideration, January 19, 1990. And along the way, in the help that we try to offer to other former kids stars, and frankly, working kids, we began to learn a lot of things that were greatly troubling. For example, children in the entertainment business are exempt from federal child labor law and have been since 1938 when the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed. Now that's an absurdity. When a child works in the entertainment business, the law ought to be the same no matter what state they work in, no matter what country they work in, so that the people, the audience, can be assured that the children are being protected, that money is being saved, that a teacher is being supplied, and they don't work excessive hours. Now, what's interesting about this is anytime you see an animal in a movie or a television show, we've all seen the end credits, no animal was killed or injured in the making of this film. For certain. But why doesn't it say that about children? So um, those are the kind of things you learn along the way. And what happens, you see, Hollywood is not at all what it claims to be. Uh, if a producer can save a buck by, say, moving the production to Pennsylvania instead of filming in, in California where the rules are pretty strict, they'll do it. That's why things like John and Kate Plus Eight uh, were taped in uh, uh, Pennsylvania because no one applied the child labor laws. Holy cow. So I'm, I'm going to go back here to the, the, um, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. Why, why do you think, and you know, even though the answer is probably obvious, um, I mean, why has this um, endeavor to protect children just been stuck in the mud for so long and we're protecting everything else but not children? Is it money, lobbyists, influence? I don't know. You tell me. Well, absolutely. Uh, 
absolutely it's so obvious. Let me give you a little history lesson here. Now remember, 1938 is when Jackie Coogan's lawsuit was resolved, and the famous Coogan Law came into effect, but only in California. Now, when they were discussing the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938, William Randolph Hearst, a man you've heard of, I'm sure, came to Washington through his lobbyists and said, hey, wait a second, I employ tens of thousands of children, and, and they deliver morning papers, and they deliver afternoon papers. I can't pay them straight time. I need an exemption. And because it was William Randolph Hearst, an exemption was granted to what they called the Newsies, the kids that delivered newspapers back in the day. Well, another group came forward. Uh, those are the owners and operators of family farms. You remember that uh, uh, quaint little concept, family farm, which of course we don't have anymore. No. Anyway, the family farmers came to Congress and said, hey, well, our own children are employed in our fields. We take great care of them. We never let harm come to them. We need an exemption. So the agricultural uh, uh, field was exempted. Well, Hollywood, which was then dominated by some very smart men, uh, saw a good thing and decided to cash in on it. So they went to Congress and said, hey, listen, we take wonderful care of our children. Just look at Nikki Rooney. Just look at Shirley Temple. And, and uh, we have teachers. We, they work limited hours. We have great rules. We need an exemption. So Congress granted them an exemption. The fact is there are over 40 exemptions to federal child labor law in the Fair Labor Standards Act. Well, in the case of Hollywood, Hollywood suddenly started farming out all of its work to other states, to other countries, and the law did not follow, the California law did not follow the children. And once producers learned that they can make an extra buck or two by exploiting children, and uh, causing them to work excessive hours and not supplying a studio teacher, uh, they started to do it more and more. And in the world we live in today, uh, about half of all television and movie production takes place outside of California. And uh, the rules may or may not be in place. Yeah, th that, that is a history lesson and an education, my friend, and, and, and thank you for that. Now, I remember the last time you were on, uh, you had mentioned the fact that you were called to a studio for uh, a, a mother who had purchased a uh, fine automobile on her child's um, labor, and uh, you were called to intercede, and you did. Are, are you still doing that? Are you doing more than that? Are you getting more calls, less calls? I mean, is, is the light starting to go on? I mean, I, I, I would hope so for... Well, we, we would all hope so, but the fact is, every five years, there's a new generation of kid stars, of young actors, and stage parents, I'm sad to say, continue to make the same mistakes. Uh, it is perfectly normal for a stage parent whose child had maybe got a good role in a movie that shot in Texas to tell her friends, oh, we did a movie last year. And as I said to my own mother, uh, where's the we in we did a movie last year? I'm the one who learned the lines. I'm the one who hit the marks. I'm the one who delivered the performance, not you. Because, frankly, stage parents are glorified babysitters on a set. There's lots of adults around, and, and their, their position uh, it is suspect. And, and not, in, in fairness, just consider what a stage parent is asked to do. You are compelled, at least in California, by law, to be present at the workplace, and yet you are not paid. The production companies have got to start figuring out that if you're going to employ a child, the person who's their babysitter ought to be compensated. It's just fairness. Otherwise, the temptation, even for a parent, for a well-meaning mom or dad, is to take a cut of their child's earnings. That's where the mischief begins. For sure, for sure, and, and I mean it's, uh, it, it, it uh, yeah, it, uh, because what do I do if I have a, uh, a gainful job, if you will, I, and in order to, uh, but if I, if I give up my gainful job because I, I have to do it for the sake of my child, but how do I pay the mortgage? And, yeah. That, that's exactly right. 
And, and uh, you know, you asked about that. And the same kinds of people continue to call a minor consideration today. Concerned crew members, that may be even a craft service person, it may be a wardrobe lady. Uh, it might be someone from makeup and hair that sees abuse and wants something done about it. It may be the theatrical unions uh, who have jurisdiction, now it's SAG-AFTRA, who may call. Uh, that they want to have an intervention, but it can't be a formal one. Uh, it could be a distributor. It can be a record company. The good thing is that we're here to answer the phone calls. My uh, number is public. My address is public. As I told the unions, if somebody's looking for me, give them my number. I'm not hiding from anybody in our websites, uh, whether Facebook or minor considerations, are open to all. So there's no excuse to tolerate abuse, whether you witness it or, or are the victim of it. Yeah, for, for certain, and I mean, God bless you for all the fine work you've done, because uh, if, if not for that, if there wasn't one voice of reason out there, I shudder to think what would happen. You know, it's... Uh... Well, I, I agree with you, and, and you know, here's the interesting thing. I, I, I try always to say, it's not just me. There are 600 former kid stars who belong to this group, and more and more are coming in every day. The new generation is, you know, 20, 30, 40 years younger than I. So we're talking kids in their 20s to their 40s who are uh, interested in this, who want to do something. They're, we are all a part of it because uh, it's such a unique experience, truly unique, that you have to have done it in order to understand it. And I'm proud to say that, uh, that this membership is growing and the, the intelligence and courage and energy these youngsters are bringing to the equation these days is fabulous. You know, I've been doing this for 30 years. So I'm getting a little tired. <laughs> well, you certainly don't show it, but I certainly understand. And, you know, in, in getting to recent developments, I mean, what I found particularly heartbreaking uh, and, and, and heartbreaking is a trivializing term, is that whole mess in Canada with the, uh, with the child porn. And the level of people involved and the level of trust uh, that, you know, you would place in a nurse, a teacher, a lawyer, a parent, and they're all going out for the benefit of those who aren't familiar with it. You, number one, you need to be, but number two, and they're all going out and exploiting these children and I, I mean, I, I was beyond shocked, and I thought your Facebook post of that was so right on. And it's just, it, it's amazing to me how, how depraved this society, I often say that in America, but, you know, Canada, I often thought, you know, maybe they've got a little bit on us, and, you know, now it's like unbelievable. You know, sadly, this is a global problem. Uh, the, the Internet has, has refined and helped expand the exploitation of children in the most negative sense. Uh, the problem is uh, pe pedophiles have always been with us. Uh, pedophiles are probably the, the, the lowest of the low. Sure. Even in prison, pedophiles are routinely uh, punished by their fellow prisoners. Uh, the fact is, that there have always been a certain percentage of the adult population that is drawn sexually and emotionally to children, particularly prepubescent children, children before they hit those, those awkward teenage years. Sure. And we used to take care of this, uh, you know, a person who, who harmed a child within a small community, that person just somehow disappeared. Um, unfortunately, we have forgotten the lessons of, of what it means to be human and what our what our uh, uh, the percentage of risk factors are, and we are letting these people get away with it. And you can see it in our popular culture with the sexualization of children. You can see it in beauty pageants. You can see it where in in popular music, where even the youngest of young girls are being asked to perform in ways that are, frankly, I thought, reserved for strip clubs. And we're not doing anything about it. No, we, uh, we, we sit there, we blink, we, we, we giggle, we say, oh, what a shame, and you're right, we don't do anything about it. And, and what you can depend on, for sure, is that the predators will always find jobs 
that involve children. We may wring our hands all we want, but the fact is that a hockey coach, a football coach, a tennis teacher, a nurse, a teacher, they're in positions where the children come. And we can add in the priests as well. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, there are children, there will be predators. It's it, 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 it's it, it's it's unspeakable. I I, I don't have words. It's it, it just it's a, it's a terrible thing. But uh, you know, it's uh, you're right. It's the society we live in. Speaking of which, and in, in a minor gear shift, I did not know, and pardon my ignorance to you, sir, that you were actively involved in the uh, television show Aging in L.A. And I was reading the. Uh, the, the, the really incredible body of work you've done there with uh, the older folks in Los Angeles. And I'm curious, and maybe you, you haven't been asked this, or maybe you have on the show, the health care system in this country and what's happening with that, especially as the folks my age and you know your age, a few years older than I, get older. I mean, I get very, very concerned about what's happening, and I don't know what the situation is. Have you had discussions about this? Have you thought about it? Have you spoken out about it? Oh, absolutely. You know, I've been doing this show for about eight years. Uh, about ten years ago, my wife and I became responsible, so to speak, for five elderly women, among them Rana's mother and my mother. And uh, we were, uh, uh, just to put it bluntly, we were overmatched. Mm -hmm. And in seeking out help, uh, I came across the Department of Aging and was happily asked to host uh, Aging Well in L.A. And boy, did I learn a lot. And it was so helpful to be prepared for, for the, the special needs of elderly people. And when I became engaged in that, I found that elderly people... Uh, particularly those seniors who are living alone, uh, have the same sort of risk factors that children have, and no one speaks for them. No. Uh, it's like a forgotten generation. And, you know, 10,000 people a day are turning 65. That's, That's right. the baby boomers. They're coming online. And frankly, if we don't get a handle on, on, the, on the care of this aging population, rapidly aging population, it's going to bankrupt this country. It's it's an incredibly amazing thing in the options. You know, Mark, my young producer, and I, we had someone near and dear to us, and the costs of care, of just, and we're not talking great care, we're just talking care to, to, to quote unquote, just basic function care in a high cost jurisdiction, you know, you live in one, this person lived in one, Fairfield County, Connecticut. Um, yeah, I mean, Fairfield County for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, uh, our Auntie Ruth, who suffered from Alzheimer's uh, and endured this illness for eight years until her death in her mid-90s, her care, when we first started out, cost $7,700 a month. Yeah, right. A month. She was in a special facility, 24-7 care, uh, you know, a, a controlled access, but that's how much it can cost, and it's gone up since her day. Now, there are alternatives, but no one ever talks about the alternatives. For example, residential facilities like a home in a neighborhood with four bedrooms that may have six residents uh, and a family to care for them. Uh, that can be a low-cost option that, frankly, provides better care and more security. Sure. That's about 3500 a month. So you can see uh, what we're talking about. But, but get this, we are 400,000 beds short in senior care facilities. We're short at least a million people, caregivers, and uh, uh, people qualified in geriatrics to take care of our elderly population. We, we're not... We're not making progress here. In fact, the numbers are overwhelming. It's, it's an amazing thing, and yet I think a lot of um, corporate America, if you will, has sort of made this, uh, shall we say, a profit center to the detriment of those involved. Now, maybe that's an acute statement, but that's just something that I've seen in my profession, because the costs are just so astronomical and Paul we're we're not talking delivering Rolls Royce level services here we're just not but here's one thing you must you must keep in mind 
Uh, even though corporate America, there are many things we can challenge them on. Mm -hmm. The fact is, when they make mistakes, they go out of business. Look at what's happening with Obamacare. Who, I want to know, was responsible for this debacle? Because if you think corporate America runs things badly, ask yourself how good the government is going to be running this. I'm already hearing horror stories out here on the West Coast of care and, and uh, medical treatment being denied seniors because it's not productive. Uh, you know, it's not a rational use of our resources. I'm hearing these horror stories already. It's and, and it's such an, an amazing thing because uh, you've been involved in businesses. I've been involved in businesses, and you know the biblical admonition is count the cost, figure out what this is going to cost you before you did it. If I look at the whole Affordable Care Act, and I'm not going to call myself an expert, but man, oh man, it's just like we're going to throw all this against the wall, and it's all going to stick just fine, and. I it, and you look at it and you say, how is that possible? And, uh, and, well, and sadly, we're bearing I that out. I, it's only possible if you uh, ignore personal responsibility. We're supposed to take care of this. In fact, a hundred years ago, uh, Granny and Grandpa lived in the family home with their children and their grandchildren. And these matters were taken care of because it was your responsibility. And if you needed help, your church or your synagogue or your local community leaders found a way to bring food to your home, to mm -hmm. provide an extra care we had to what we call respite care. But we turned this all over to the government, and I'm sorry, the government is one of the most inefficient things there is. Remember Ronald Reagan's wonderful quote. <laughs> he said, the nine scariest words you can ever hear uh, hi, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. I remember it well. I I, I really do, and it's uh, uh, some somehow we've we, we've just misplaced all of that. But uh, to to end this interview, and we're we're always so grateful when you're on on a much happier note. Uh, what are your current activities going into the end of this year and into 2014, so we may continue to follow the great work that you're doing, Paul? Well, we, we are refocusing our efforts with this new crop of former kid stars uh, to get national legislation, finally, to end the exemption. And we hope to ride that pony all the way to the finish line and come in first. It is ludicrous that industry animals are protected better than our children. we got to fix that. So that's the main mission next year. Other... Uh, other young performers or former kids stars will be carrying the ball on that one. And I, I'm hoping that the various uh, film commissions that exist in other states stop holding out the absence of child labor laws as a production incentive. We have to stop doing this. For sure. I know my home state, Connecticut, was extremely generous with uh, the movie business for a time, they realized that uh, in doing it, um, economically you hand out more in credits than you could ever hope to recoup, notwithstanding the fact that when you've got a, a small state like this one with very limited access and resources, you clog up entire cities so somebody can make an entire movie. Hopefully we're seeing less of that. I've, I, I've been very acute about that in the past, but uh, you know, it's um, it, it, it's amazing what people will do for a short-term dollar, and I'm I'm consistently amazed. I I, I really yeah, am. Me, me too. Look, the lure of Hollywood and and the what we call soft money it represents uh, is almost too good for politicians to pass up. But there is always a cost, and and people have to weigh and measure. You know, Hollywood uh, has got plenty of money, and they ought to be paying their own way. Uh, I do not like production incentives because they uh, are that smacks of, of political favoritism. Don't like it. It, it yeah, it, it most certainly does, but. Believe it or not, Paul, our time is up. Thank you again so much for being with us. Have a wonderful Christmas, a wonderful holiday. Uh, we'll continue to communicate on Facebook, and uh, we'll have you back again as things develop. There's always something to discuss, and uh, you're the man to bring us to. Us. God bless, take care, best to your family, and we'll be talking soon, my friend. Thank you, and blessings to you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you.
Paul Peterson, and uh, so pleased to have him, will be circling around third and winding to home plate in just a moment as we end the December 3rd, 2013 show. Tony D'Angelo here on Connecticut Morning. We'll be back to you right after this.